and we're live. All right, everyone. Welcome back to Get Out of the System. Recently changed the name of the podcast to help you become financially free through real estate. And today I have the prime example of that person. He, this is a guy who came from nothing, struggled more than probably anyone you've ever known. But this guy is a real estate multimillionaire and I'm excited to have Nate on today. Hey, Nate, how you doing? Man, I'm doing amazing. I'm here with you. Thank you for having me on, brother. Of course, bro. I love your energy. Uh, I really like being on your uh, on your podcast, so I'm excited to ask you the questions now. So to get going, how about we uh, tell the audience more about who you are and what you do? So my name is Nate Barger. Um, just like a lot of you guys, I come from a uh, normal blue collar, alcoholic family, you know, struggled, never knew anything about money. Um, I mean, Dave Ramsey probably would have been an improvement over what my parents did. And, you know, just poverty mindset, scarcity mindset. If you can't afford it, pay cash, you know, you know, um, grew up in kind of a, a, a neighborhood that got um, affected greatly by the crack epidemic of the late uh, 80s, early 90s. And um, end up getting sent away to, to an orphanage when I was 14. 14 and I ended up getting out when I was about 16 end up selling drugs falling into the streets um going to prison twice just everything I did everything I everything I did I failed man I must have I must have failed at 20 different companies but thankfully for me man by the time I was 22 my time in prison was over and that didn't mean that when I got out, I went straight. It just mean I never got caught again. So from 22 to 29, I made over $20 million selling weed. I was bringing in weed from Mexico, from, um, you know, I was getting from down in Brownsville, South Padre Island, also down around um, Tucson, south of there. So Matamoros and Nogales, those were the places that we were bringing weed in. And it was lucrative business. And oddly enough, I didn't even smoke weed. I didn't do drugs. I was bad alcoholic. So at the time I was 29, man, I had say everything money could, you know, anything you could possibly think money. I mean, I was really legitimately making 242,000 a week in profit. So when you think about someone in their twenties, making that much cash, paying no taxes, you feel like money, I can do whatever I want, you know? And that was only bringing in 330 pounds of weed every week. Right. So, um, you know, I remember they were like, Nate, we want to give you 4,000 pounds of weed. And I was like, man, I don't know, man, you're going to make me hot. So um, I, I, I always wanted to do something different. I just didn't know. Nobody would give me a job. I didn't have anybody around me with money. And so I just cried out to God one day, man. I was almost to the point where I was suicidal, brother. I was 29 years old. I had a nightclub. I had, you know, a half a million dollars in cars. I had women. But I was miserable. And I realized at the time that... um something needed to change or I was going back to the pr back to prison for a very long time. So I just cried out to God, man. And, um, my life began to change that, that very moment. Wow. That is a, probably one of the most crazy stories I've heard on my show, if not the craziest. Um, so well, wait, it gets even worse. No. <laughs> so go ahead, brother. <laughs> so, um, I, I guess my first question is, how'd you transition from that to going into real estate? Well, when I cried out to God, I really didn't know what to do. You know, I had some money, but I had no idea what to do. Like, literally, everything I did, man, I literally lost money. A nightclub, tire and rim shop, you know. I mean, I had a roofing company that I guess I made money, but it just wasn't enough. It was like, I was making two grand a week. And I was like, man, that ain't no money. You know how your mindset is, man. Like, man, that ain't even worth my time. And so when I cried out to God, man, I realized that the feds was watching me. I was going to prison for a very long time because they use a multiple, a multiplier in there. I didn't even mention to you guys, I probably got arrested at least 20 times in my twenties, maybe 30. So I had a lot of cases. I just, I, I, I found good attorneys. I found how to uh, maneuver through the legal system. And I beat a lot of those cases. I mean, I was on probation most of the time. Some of them I got, they weren't felonies um, DUIs. And so, um, he showed me real estate within about an hour. I put a business plan together and I did what most Americans would have been proud of. I'm, I, I came up with a plan where I could make $10,000 a month, but you got to understand when you come from selling drugs and making a lot of money, 10,000 a month, I was like, man, I can't live off that. 
my budget, this is how reckless I was. My budget, I was probably the only one of the drug dealers you would know that had a budget. My budget was 57000 a month, man. A month. Like, that's ridiculous, right? And so I never had any peace because, yeah, I'm making all this money, but I'm always spending a lot of money. And I'm help, I, th I think I'm helping people. I'm not helping them. I'm, I'm enabling them. And so uh, that's when I really learned real estate. And I bought a couple properties. And I, at the time, I didn't know what I was doing. I just called it cash out refis at the time. But I didn't understand we were doing the burr. And so I did that from 2004 when I quit selling drugs. 2005, I got my first properties. By 2010, I had about 250 units. So I was good at growing. I just bought the wrong time, brother. Like 2010 was terrible in the Midwest. Like properties literally went for nothing. And so everything I had, I was over leveraged. I didn't understand the system and I was bankrupt. Lost everything I ever worked for. And... That was tough because now I got a wife and I got a kid, right? Two kids. And so I got married in 07. She helped me get sober because I'd become a really bad alcoholic uh, myself. And I've been sober since November of 06, thank God. And that's the same month my son um, was born. And um, like I said, I lost everything. And I just stopped back like, man. You feel like such an idiot. Like, man, all that money I had, like, you blew it. You blew it, bro. And um, what was I going to do? Go back to selling drugs? I promise I would never do that again. Because it wasn't about me anymore. It was about now I got a wife and kids that are dependent on me. So it's a little different. McDonald's wouldn't even give me a job. Not that I went and applied, but I'm just telling you, like, four felonies, man. You know, all these arrests, man, over 60 arrests. Like, nobody's giving you no job. You ain't getting it. And so um, I just kept doing real estate. I was like, I got to figure this out. Actually, in the middle of uh, uh, bankruptcy, I was driving my wife through the neighborhood we live in now, multi-million dollar neighborhood. I said, babe, we, we moving over here. Like, this, you know, I want you to start thinking about picking out a house. And she must have think like, man, this dude delusional. Look, sheriff knocking at our door every day, giving notices to go to court. But I figured it out. And I was like, man, I figured it out. And she never doubted me. She never was like, well, no, you didn't. Da, 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 da. She just, like, supported me. You know, like, hey, like, you need me to go get a job? I was like, nah, I got this. Like, that's really what pushed me. When we got together, I agreed to be the breadwinner. She said, Nate, I don't want to have to do corporate. I hate it. I said, well, what you want to do, babe? She said, I just want to raise the kids. I want to stay at home. I said, well, we'll do that. I got it. And so when she offered to go get that job back that I knew she hated, bro, it literally just gave me, like, I didn't care. Like, I'm, I'm where the brick wall is at, I'm running through them. And when you get that mindset that I'm running through brick walls, and when I get up, I'm running through some more brick walls. It doesn't matter, you know? So my mindset had shifted. Not only that, but I began to, um, I began to, I began to like really accept my life and not be anxious about things. I really understood that if I prayed on things and I really had any type of faith at all, that I had no faith if I said, oh, it's not working out. Man, everything ain't got to work out in the time that you think. That's not always the time that it's for. Because a lot of things that I wanted myself, if I'd have been given them prematurely before I was ready, I wouldn't, I, I would have probably screwed it up. So everything comes in due time. And so I emerged from bankruptcy in 2013 um, with a vast amount of knowledge, with a 429, I think it was 400 something credit score, no money. My tax returns for the two previous years were negative 359,000 and negative 329,000. Within 30 months from there, I would retire with 35,000 a month in passive income. And people say, well, how'd you do it? I mean, number one, God. Number one, number two, my wife. But number three, because I just, what, was you, gonna, what, what you gonna do to me? I already failed, what you gonna do, right? What I have no, I have absolutely no fear, zero fear of failing because I'm already down here. What you going to do to me? So I just went out, man, and I just work relentlessly. I work tirelessly. I learned my skill set. My skill set was finding deals, strategizing, putting deals together. My weakness were I didn't have any money, right? 
I didn't have any financials. I couldn't sign for debt. But I knew how to manage properties. I knew how to do the construction. I knew what a deal was. I knew how to find deals. I just went and put the team together. I went and found people that had credit, you know, that were worth $5, $10 million that believed in me. I went and found people that put the money up. And I started syndicating with a 400 credit score, man, right? And letting them know, like, hey, man, I can't sign for debt. Like, look, I can manage the properties. I know what I'm doing. Well, ha what happened, Nate? Man, I went bankrupt. Why'd you go bankrupt? Because I didn't know what I know now, right? And then I learned, I studied, brother, every book I could read, I learned about. So if you ask me almost anything about real estate, I know it because I lived it, because I failed, because I spent over $10 million educating myself, failing, going to seminars, building out systems. So after you fail, it's time to go forward. The problem is, man, most people don't realize that if they're failing, you're on the right path. You are on the right path, man. If you aren't failing, you are not on the right path. That means that you aren't pushing yourself. You are not. And I'm not saying in the beginning. I'm talking about after you get the skill sets, the average millionaire goes bankrupt three and a half times. I never plan on going bankrupt again. Today, I got, you know, over 250 million in real estate. I got another 160, 170 million in deals we're working on. We're going into a, a time in the economy where it's starting to pull back, which is great for sophisticated um, investors, it's the best time ever. I hate to see what it does to some people that didn't understand the market or buying the right market, but um, man, it was really just for me, it's crazy, come full circle in under a decade. Man, yeah, I, I think the most profound thing about your story that a lot of people don't understand is that the journey of an entrepreneur, you have to go through a lot of shit. You have to go through a lot of, a lot of bad times and you have to come up from the mud, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but before I succeeded in real estate, I mean, I failed in multiple businesses. I, you know, hated school. I sucked in uh, certain subjects. I sucked at certain businesses like e-commerce. I totally failed in, lost over $50,000 in. So I think people just don't see that, right? People only see on social media, like the Nate that's, you know, build a $250 million empire, but no one sees the Nate that went to prison, sold drugs, went bankrupt, had a credit score of 400, 400 points and raised money and started buying real estate. Right. So no one sees mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like the tough part of entrepreneurship. I think your story really highlights that you have to go through some really bad times to see the good times. Yeah. So, so man, when people have envy and look, I could go be a billionaire if I wanted to, I don't really have a desire to because I know what it takes to get there. I know the level of commitment that it takes. And so don't be envious of somebody who has something. Trust me, they didn't get it by luck. They didn't. You know, and then if their parents gave them something, there's a different set of circumstances that come with that, man. 88% uh, of millionaires are self-made, so not many parents are giving things to kids. But if people's parents are giving them stuff, man, they already took the dog out to fight, man. I mean, the person has no motivation. Like my kids, man, what, what am I going to do to motivate them, man? Like literally, you know, they drive around Lamborghinis, Bentleys, and go on two-month uh, two vacations and live in a multi-million dollar. How am I going to motivate them? My motivation was for my kids. Now it's for my students. And in my first 17 months, man, my students have increased their net worth over $280 million, brother. So for me, I love teaching people this stuff. I love taking people to society said, man, you'll never be nothing. Oh, yeah, well, watch this, right? Society may, may have misunderstood who you were, but I was that person. I remember my teacher telling me that in eighth grade, you'll never amount to anything. I'm sitting here thinking, man, you, no offense, but you're a teacher. You know, and I was selling drugs at the time. So I can understand now that that teacher probably loved me, but that was a projection of his own insecurity and fears. He was projecting that on me, which told me his emotional intelligent level. He didn't understand how to communicate with me. Hey, Nate, look, man, if you go down this path, all he knew was the fear part. And so as you go through life, man, and you start to learn this stuff, then it just really becomes about, to me, I'm blown away, man. So many people don't know 
the stuff that they should know, the basics. And there's so much money out here to be made, but the school systems don't teach you. Your parents don't know. College, they sure as hell ain't going to teach you, man. They're gonna, college is going to teach you how to work for a corporation and make them wealthy. I want to know, I want to teach you what the corporation, the guys going to corporations know. That's what I want you to learn. So that's what I've been out here doing, brother. It's amazing, man. That's what do you think passion. is the toughest challenge? What do you think is the toughest challenge you ever faced in your life out of all the ones you faced? Um, man, I mean, prison was not tough because I was young. And I grew up in such a dysfunctional environment that just you were expected to go to prison. I mean, really, imagine that. So that's not a big deal because you already knew, Where like, yeah, from? I'm going to prison. I'm from Cincinnati. Okay. But, you know, you kind of know, like, man, I, I, okay, I'm going to prison, right? That's not something that I can really avoid. That's just part of the journey. Um, you know, my best friend got in a shootout with the police, man. That was, that was pretty tough because he was hostage situation on the news. But he told me, Nate, I ain't going back to prison. I said, man, you're either telling me two things. You're going to kill yourself or are you snitching? I know you ain't no snitch. So I knew that was, that was in February and, and he was dead in June. So I knew that was coming. So that wasn't extremely hard. Um, I think the hardest part for me was literally figuring out business, banging my head against the glass, crying because I didn't know how I was going to take care of my family. That was the hardest part, man, if, I, if I'm honest. Because every, nothing else was, everything else was about myself. The alcoholism, that was about myself. But when I had, when I got my wife that I always wanted and my family, like now I got something to live for. Before that, you don't have nothing to live for. It doesn't really matter. That part was hard. And I literally used to cry every single time. I, I had, a, I mean, look, brother, I would fill my schedule up so full so that I didn't have time to deal with my emotions. My emotions wanted to give up every day. Imagine that. One time I'm sitting in the car and it was four o'clock and I'm running two shifts, bro, to get these jobs done. Right. And it's like, OK. Oh, man, I got five minutes to think for myself. I got five minutes to decompress and five minutes. I got to make a call. Literally all my mind could tell me was, Nate, you got to give up. You can't get this done. There's no way. How are you going to do this? So, you know what my response was in my mind? That's the last time I give you five minutes. Every time I give you some time, all you do is think about giving up. I ain't got time for that. So I filled my schedule. It was dysfunction. I took that dysfunction that I had, and I filled my schedule up so much that I literally woke up with a pile of work in front of me, went to sleep with a pile of work in front of me. And I did that for those 30 months, brother. And I accumulated enough cash flow to retire. And, man, that was a great feeling. We moved down to Florida. I thought we were going to live there. My wife was, you know, after four or five months, she was like, are you just going to go fishing every day? And I'm saying, like, well, nah. I mean, sometimes it's windy, you know, and I'm serious. And, you know, so and she was like, this isn't, this isn't the life I wanted, you know, and I miss my mom. And so we come back to Cincinnati, man. And I called my partner, Mike, and I said, man, come home, man. Kind of want to do some deals. And um, we were doing a deal. We we're looking at a deal. And I said, yeah, Mike, we can make a million off of that. But man, it ain't really worth the time. Right. And he said, Nate, hold on. What did you just say? I said, man, that's not really worth our time, Mike. He said, did you just say we're going to turn down a million dollars? I was like, yeah, man, like we don't need the money. So when you get to that point, that's when I realized that's where the real success is. That's the new American dream. It's being able to say no. I'm saying no to money. Because money, you got to get to that level, though. You got to do whatever you got to do to get to that level. I don't care about the circumstances. Get to that goal. Once you get to that goal, you can turn it down. Until then, man, run to that goal. You can get there in five years. So what's your, um, <clears throat> what's like your piece of advice for, you know, someone who was in your shoes before and knew nothing about real estate and they're looking to get in today? Get around people that are doing what you want to do. For me, there was literally nobody in my community 
or in my Rolodex, what we called it back in the day. You know what Rolodex is? Yeah. It's like an old yeah, CRM so, kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, pretty much your CRM. Yeah, like your, your like your phone book. Like there was nobody that I could call that knew anything except selling drugs, robbing people. Like, and so I, I, I used to tell my partner, Mike, because he didn't grow up rich either. I said, man, how do we meet the rich people? How do we meet these people? Well, now you got social media. You got groups. You're like, this dude here doing real estate. He wants to do real estate. Man, get in some masterminds, man. I just paid 68 grand for a mastermind. I continue to educate myself at a higher level so that I can move forward. You know, paying um, to, to, to get on board with the right people is like getting in a fast lane. Like, I don't want to be in a slow lane. I don't want to take five years to figure this out. People are like, you can learn it on YouTube and Google. Oh, you can't. You don't even know what to ask YouTube or Google. You know, those are the things. So for me, get you. Look, I ain't saying, man, I'm just going to say it. If I don't even know what you would go to college for now. Right. And I'm not trying to be funny, but doctors are getting replaced. Right. By AI, a lot of them. So are attorneys. So I used to say, well, yeah, if you want to be a doctor, attorney, go to college. But I don't even know what else you would go to college for now, unless you want to build robots or build some type of tech that that's an expanding market. Right. Everything else is probably sh shrinking. So I would say learn how to do real estate. Real estate is tried and true. And you can get in with little to no money. You can learn how to wholesale. You can learn how to wholesale to yourself. Um, you learn how to leverage money. And when you go in a bank and people are so scared of the bankers, man, that guy in the bank, he about to get fired if he don't give out some money. You know that, right? When you deposit money into a bank, I need you guys to understand this. When you deposit money into a bank, you know what a bank, you, you know what that money is to you? What is that money to you? It's an asset. As soon as you deposit that money in a bank, you know what it is to them? Jason, you know what it is to them? Go ahead. It's a liability. Money's a liability to a bank. Man, get that crap out of here, man. They don't want that. They do what's called fractional reserve banking. If you put 10000 in the bank, they can go loan 120000 against it. Now what they do is they take that liability, which is money, and they create an asset, which is debt. Understand how the banking system works. Don't go out here and be mad at it. Like, who cares if that's how it works? That's how it works. You're not about to change that, man. What you can do is get wealthy off of it. You understand the tax code. You understand leverage. You understand what a good rate of return is. Like, Jay, ask one of your, ask somebody in your audience, what's a good rate of return, man, on TikTok? What's a good, I mean, guys, I know we're doing a podcast, but we're on TikTok too. Since you guys can't respond, I'm going to show you what most people think a good return is. And then we're going to run through some little math real quick, if you don't mind. Probably like six to eight percent. That's what people think. Six to eight. Okay. So what what's inflation right now? Scotty said fifteen percent. Okay, Scotty. I'll inflation, I'll take your money any day. Huh? <laughs> inflation right now is you know it's I think what like eight nine percent or something like that. Last time I checked. So if I'm giving you six percent on your money, inflation is nine. You losing three percent of your money a year, man. The yeah. math ain't mathing, right? Scotty, 15%. The average that Americans make is about 7%. So they got to work the rest of their life. They got to work 30, 40 years to become okay. Now, look, let me show you how real estate works, okay? You want to use 100,000 as an example or a million. We could use either one. I just want to use a number. Because people say, well, I can't buy now for 100,000. People say millions too much. So I just want to use a basic round number. Is that okay? Can we all agree to that? Okay, so... We got a hundred thousand dollar house. You know what the one percent rule is, right? A one percent yep. rule means that I can rent that house out for one percent of the value a month. One percent of a hundred thousand is what? Anybody? It's a thousand bucks. I, I okay? was waiting for someone to answer on here, but no one answered. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's a thousand dollars, man. They got a little lag time. So $1,000 a month times 12 months is what? 12 grand, right? 12 grand, yeah. You take out your vacancies, your taxes, your insurance, your property management, your turnovers, your reserves, your gas, electric, water, and sewage, your advertising. You're sitting at about $7,800. 
So you got 7,800, but you don't have a mortgage on it. You go to the bank, say, hey, Mr. Banker, I need to borrow $100,000 to buy this property. I know you can't buy one for 100, make it 500. Just times it by five. It's a mathematical formula. Go to the banker, say, hey, Mr. Banker, I need to borrow $100,000 to buy this property. He says, Nate, how are you going to pay me? I said, man, look, I got 12000 in rent. I got 7800 after I pay everything coming in. He says, great, you can serve his debt. I'll tell you what, Nate, put 20% down. What's 20% of 100000 20K. 20K. So that's my capital stack. I got to put 20 grand down. Now, I buy, I find areas that are going to appreciate by 5.5% a year. Now, this may not happen in one year. One year, maybe 2%. One year, maybe 8 One year, maybe 9 One year, maybe 4 it, It's an average. Since 1963, across the continental United States, we've averaged a 5.56% return. So I'm taking a law of average because this is what I do. 5.5%, let's say 5.5% of 100000 is what? 5500 all right, so we got 5,500 in appreciation. Okay, now that's 7,800 that we were left with before our mortgage. I go to the bank. What kind of rate am I getting from the bank? Right now, you're getting like somewhere in the sixes, like 6.3, 6.5 for an investment loan. Okay, so I'm at like five and a half to six. Let's just say it's six. He's going to give me, let's say, let's say the bank gives me a 6% loan. 6% on 80,000 is what? 4,800, right? That's 4,800 a year. We had 7,800 a year. You with me? You there, brother? I'm here. Oh, okay. Your, your screen went out. I think maybe. Okay, so we got 7,800 oh, really? minus, oh. minus the 4,800 we got to pay the bank. That's 3,000. Plus, we got 5,500 in appreciation. So inclusive of cash flow, principal reduction, and appreciation, we got $8,500. Divide that by your 20 grand. That's a 42.5% return a year. So why does nobody teach people this? Once you understand this, you understand what areas to buy in, what's driving that market, what the market is likely to look like in two, three, four, or five years. Getting wealth is just something that kind of happens in your sleep. You have to own real estate. The more real estate you own, the wealthier you're going to get. It's true. Yeah. I mean, to be so honest, that's a 42% return. Bernie Madoff got people 9% and they thought he was a genius. I just showed you how to get 42% <laughs> a year. Now, my yeah. students, I show them how to get even better than that because we do what's called the Burr method. That's a cash out refi. We have no money. We have infinite returns, but I won't go into that right now. I hope you're enjoying the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen. I hope you're getting value out of it. If you don't mind doing me a quick favor, if you could leave me a five-star review and subscribe to my channel or the podcast, I would greatly appreciate it. I'm trying to reach more amazing people like yourself on the world of real estate so that you can get out of the system and live the passive income lifestyle and do what you want whenever you want. So if you could share this video with your friends, whether it's whether you're watching on YouTube or sharing the podcast link, I'd greatly appreciate it. If you can help grow the show so I can reach more amazing people, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Yeah, and I mean, to be honest, if you have more capital, I mean, um, I invest you know, in San Diego, and I've gotten 10x, 11x returns in a year through buying distressed real estate. And because, you know, when it's, when it's a higher... When it's, yeah, when it's higher value to buy, and then that means there's more profits too. So uh, if you buy a million dollar house and you put 1.2 into it and you sell it for one six, that's 400 grand. But if you buy, but the thing is your strategy is amazing because a lot of people don't have that much money to buy a million dollar property. So mm -hmm. anyone can save up enough money to buy a hundred thousand dollar house. There's no excuses. You and a couple friends can save up the money to put down 20 grand. I don't care who you are. If you don't have 20 grand, you got to start working a little more, but um, but even a million, you could do the same thing. You got to have a skill set. People always say, well, I don't have no money. The money doesn't matter. If I give you money and you don't know what you're doing, you're going to lose it, right? If you got the skill set and you got a 400 credit score, you have no money, but you got the skill set, people will give you money. That's what happened to me when I went bankrupt. Nobody cared that I was bankrupt. 
Nobody cared that, you know, why did you go bankrupt, man? I, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. You know, I got in at the wrong time. I didn't understand reserves. I bought these commercial buildings. I, oh, okay, get it. But guess what? We ain't going to do that again. We ain't going down that road. People gave me money because I had knowledge and experience, even though I went bankrupt. So how did you, th that leads me to a, a great question coming up next year. How did you raise money? raise private capital from investors? Like, how did you find them? How did you get them to, you know, put money down when you had a, you know, no credit and had a bankruptcy under your name? That's a tough, that's great a question. Tough, uh, tough so, sell. so great question. So the first thing that happened was I was in the middle of bankruptcy. I realized I couldn't put nothing else in my name, but I talked to my uh, a bankruptcy attorney said, well, you can put it in your wife's name. Your wife's not bankrupt. You could technically buy in, in her name and they can't touch anything she's doing. And she could pay you a salary to manage an asset. I said, great. So my wife didn't have no tax returns or no money either. So I couldn't use her for that. But what I could use it for was to put my shares into her name. So I found a property and I found this realtor and the realtor said, man, I haven't sold anything in three and a half years. The market was so bad here in Cincinnati. Literally bought a 25 unit for 100 I want to say 110, 120,000. I flipped it to this guy for, no, I bought it for 105,000, flipped it to this guy for 185,000. So in the middle of that, um, I, 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 the guy didn't know what the hell he was doing. And he started asking me all these questions and I had to, I had to close him because he was being so conservative. I said, look, man, if you're going to be that conservative with your numbers, you really don't even know what the hell you're doing. I was like, man, real estate might not be for you. And so he, he, luckily everything's like you say is fate, but you got to execute on fate. So he was going out playing tennis with somebody who just happened to also be looking at the same exact property. And it was like, yeah, I'm buying a 25 unit. He was like, oh yeah, me too. So now I got him in a bidding war, right? So that's how I end up like selling it real quick. Well, these guys who bought it, they were finance guys. They didn't know what they was doing. So I start talking to correspondent to him. Well, then I found another deal. The same realtor brought me this other deal. It was a 97 unit building and the guy wanted a million dollars for it. And so I call them up and they're like, oh yeah. I said, well, look, man, I had already put it under contract because I knew the realtor. The realtor knew me and he had faith that I was going to get the deal done because I sold the last one, right? I said, look, man, I don't really want to just wholesale this one. I want to be, I want to be a partner, right? I was like, it's me and Mike and it's you too. I was like, we all get 25%. And he was like, okay, uh, how are we going to come up with the money? I said, well, look, here's how we're going to come up with the money. I said, the guy's 82 years old. Nobody's going to buy this property right now. What we're going to do is put it under contract. You guys are going to take it to the bank. The financials are so screwed up. The bank's going to come back and say, I can't finance it. We go back to him and tell him, dude, you got to hold, hold a note on it, right? I said, we did. We told him, you got to hold a note on it. He said, well, you got to give me 150 grand. I said, man, I'm going to do the construction. Y'all got to come up with 150 grand. And I was like, and I need some renovation costs. And I said, we can raise that later, but we can push these rents immediately. And that's what we, that was our first deal. And after that, man, we was off to the races. We improved the value of that property in like 12 months from a million to 2.4 million. We went and cashed out 1.6, 1.7. We paid him off. We paid the dude off the 850. Guess what? <laughs> we got the dude to loan us the money back, man. He 80 something years old. He don't need the money. That's it. That's how I got started. Then in the process, we start buying more hundred unit complexes. That building I bought for 13,000 a unit. We sold that. We, we sold that off for 6 million. That was a million dollar deal. We sold it off for 6 million. So we just did the same thing over and over and over again. I just found one thing in life that I was really good at. It was understanding numbers, really understanding numbers, multipliers, forced appreciation, how capitalization rates work, how to do tax uh, uh, pro. I mean, how to do uh, uh, what do you call it? Tax um, appeals. So that property we appealed. No. Uh, well, depreciation, too, but tax appeal. That building was valued at like three million bucks. So check this out. Three million dollars. You're paying seventy five thousand a year in taxes, right? Now that I paid a million for it, I came and got it reassessed where the taxes dropped to 25 grand. That $50,000, I negotiated that in my contract that if I get that, those are pay, paid in the arrears that that money comes back to me. 
Don't start buying these properties. You got money coming from everywhere. You went in tax appeals, you're getting chunks, forty, fifty thousand dollar checks back from being broke, right? Now my taxes dropped to twenty five thousand instead of seventy five thousand. That's all super cash flow. Because when you go to refinance it, they don't reassess your taxes on a refi. They do it on a, on a sale. Yeah. So I just learned so much in the process and I just was passionate about getting stuff done. And I just didn't care what I had to do to get there. As long as it was ethical, moral, and legal, we doing it. How are you finding your deals? I mean, you found some great deals in your life. How are you finding them? People bring them to me. You take care of people. You take care of people. They take care of you. Like one of my realtors, the guy, same guy I'm telling you about that brought me to deals. So one of the deals he brought me, we end up paying 240,000 for, it was a 48 unit. He ended up, we ended up fixing it up. He sold it for a million six, five, but he came, he said, yeah, Nate, I'll do this at 3%. I'll take, I'll take 3%. I said, Hey man, I ain't doing no 3% commission with you. And he was like, okay, two. I said, no, five, I'm giving you 5%. Go sell the damn property. And he was like, okay. Because I don't care about a 75 or a hundred thousand. I don't care about the commission. Like, bro, bring me the deals. I take care of my brokers, man. Guess what my brokers do? They take care of you. They not hitting the market. Nate, I got a deal. <laughs> Can we work it with the owner? Look, now I give them equity. They're like, man, like or the first guy's like, hey, man, I'm going to give you some equity in the deal. He's like, okay, because I got some money to invest. I said, keep your money. He said, what do you mean? I said, man, I'm giving you equity. I don't need your money. And he's like, really? You do the same thing with the hotels, man. Now we do hotels, Marriott, Hilton, IHG, same thing. Include people, quit being petty, quit having a scarcity mindset. I want to do more deals. I'm not worried about scraping every penny up off every deal. I'm, I'm worried about, I'm building a team of people around me, man. We got a team of soldiers. Like we go out here and get it together. Take care of people because a lot of these people never even envision ownership, right? They work for 20 years selling property, never envision. I'm like, man, that's crazy, man. You ought to own some real estate. Then you get them in on a real estate. You change their life, but they ain't changing their life. You change their kid's life because you change the way they think about things in the world, the way they think about money. They start to understand the tax code. They start to really understand the operations. And now their kids want to do real estate. So who yeah, you think they're they bringing the deals to? School. You. And they ain't teaching that. Plus, they, man, I not, man, I got so many deals. I don't even, I don't even have time to underwrite them because people know. You, I don't have to have this deal under contract to bring it to Nate. Nate's not going to circumvent me. He's not going to screw me. Matter of fact, I call somebody and say, hey, man, I can't get you that $50,000 wholesale fee that you needed. Here's what I can get you, and here's why. Now it's up to you. I'll walk away from the deal before I go behind your back and take it. But this is what I can give you, and that's why. And I don't really care about a deal. I don't care if I close the deal or I don't. Because some of the best deals that I've never done are the ones I never got. And I've got circumvented before. I know what that feels like. I don't like that. So I don't want to make nobody else feel like that. I think, um, I think the biggest piece, I think the biggest takeaway people need to take from that, that answer there is you got to take care of your people, man. I mean, you got to take care of your brokers. You got to take care of your agents. Got to take care of your bankers. Um, cause your those employees? are the people that are going to bring you more business. Yeah. Employees, everyone. Um, I've seen in my life, um, the clients I've worked with, the ones who do the best, the mo the ones who own the most amount of real estate are the ones who are easy to work with. And they're, they're, you know, they're easy to work with and you can get along with them and they always treat yeah. you right. And they always make sure that you're getting taken care of the ones who aren't as successful and kind of get taken out of the market, um, and don't have good relationships are the ones that are the penny pinchers, right? They, um, try to take your commission and deals, right? They say, oh, you know, the numbers aren't working out. Can you give me half your commission and make it work? Well, I'm telling you right now as a broker, I'm never going to send you a deal ever again if you tell me that. Yeah, so, yeah, I'll tell you like know that. what? I'll, 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 I'll take a cut on my commission. I got you, man. Let's get this deal closed. But guess what? Your name, Mud. And not just that, but how do you sleep at night knowing that somebody worked their butt off for you? Like being a broker or a realtor is not easy, man. Like you're dealing with so many emotions. And... And, you know, I've seen it all. I've seen people flop and do the little thing. Like, we know what you're doing when you're doing that on the seller side. That's okay. But like you said, in a hot market, you ain't going to get no deals. In a cool market, you might, right? But Richard Branson said it best, man. And this doesn't just go for your employees. He said, 
train your employees well enough where they could go and start their own business. Treat them, treat them good enough where they'd never want to go do that. And so it's the same thing with the brokers. Like literally every broker in Cincinnati we know. Like, and, and they could they sell stuff all over the Midwest. These guys are selling a half a billion a year, some of them. And they just call you. Hey, man, I got a deal. You know, guy's in trouble, this and that. I think we can work it out. It doesn't have to hit the MLS. You know, he has some debt that we can assume. He's willing to do a seller carry back mortgage. I just want to get paid. How do we do this? All right, here's how we do it. Boom, 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 boom. You get paid at the closing table and you get some equity. Cool. And another thing, most people don't know how to underwrite deals, to be honest with you. They don't know how to find a value. They don't know how to run a construction. So the deals that other people are looking at and passing on, I could look at that deal and say, well, man, this one got an extra, you know, quarter acre lot right there. You could do this with it. got this. It, it, you got to know how to underwrite deals and look at what's really there. It could be on the corner. Highest and best use may be a knockdown. You don't even know. You could, this could be a piece of land you're going vertical on. It could be something that the guy next door needs. You could be next to a big Fortune 500 company. It's you have to learn how to analyze deals. And then the construction component. We doing construction at 45 cents on a dollar. So if me and you are out bidding on this property together, not me and you, but I'm saying another person, how are you going to compete with me? You don't know how to run the construction. It's going to take you three years to do it. We can do it in 90 days. We're efficient. We're going to get in there. We're going to be, we're not going to have a huge overhead. We're going to get in there and crush it. We got systems put together for that. Amazing. Amazing, man. Um, Nate, you got any uh, last words of advice? Any um, Anything we might have missed that you want to throw out there? What are you working on? Anything? And just go out here. I mean, we're developing some properties now, but man, the properties, it, it, it really, you know, my goal is to help 10 million people become millionaires. And people are like, oh, that's a big number. You think it should be 12 million in? See, that's the thing. People think it's a big, nothing about a big number. It's you got to have a big impact, man. When we leave this earth, that's all we got left, right? And so what are you going to do with your time while you're here? Why are you doing it? Figure out why you're doing what you're doing, right? And if you can't convey it to somebody else, that's okay. Pick a goal and stick to it. Don't pick a small goal because if you do, you're going to be upset when you reach it and say, man, I should have picked a higher goal. Just go for it, man. Go get educated first. But don't do the paralysis analysis, man. Sometimes you just got to jump in because I'm telling you right now, if you want to be an entrepreneur, man, here's an entrepreneur, man. You wake up every morning before you get out of bed, you get punched in the face because you look at your emails, you see what went wrong. Then you take another couple steps, you get punched in the side of the head. And then you say, all right, man, you know, what are the solutions to these punches? Right. And then before you know it, man, after three, four years of getting punched in the face, you wake up, you block. You, you begin to understand how to really do this well. And you're like, hey, man, you ain't, not, you ain't punching me no more, right? And because all those punches are, Nate, we had a drive-by yesterday. A tenant got killed. Nate, uh, the roof got blown off. We got water leaks. The unit's flooding, blah, blah, blah. Nate, the whole hillside fit, uh, slid in. You know, somebody hit our building. They didn't have insurance. It's like, okay, so let's fix it. Because it's no longer an emotion. It's just part of the game. And I no longer care about the circumstance. I'm so focused on the goal of getting there. And if you wake up and you spend your time and energy worrying about everything that could happen, you'll never get nothing done. Just go out here and start to fix things when they break. Go out here and when things start to break, embrace it. When you have problems, run to them. Not away from them. Where are them problems at? I'd be waking up like, man, where the problems at, man? Hey, you guys ain't got no problems today, man. I want to solve some problems. And they tell me, I said, man, they made problems, man. Don't even call me with that. So I embrace problems as challenges, man. <laughs> I really enjoy them. I really enjoy them because they used to stress me out so bad. Now I'm like, where they at, man? Now I got a little bit of money. You know, I could be like, hey, before when you ain't had no money, you'd be like, I don't want no problems. Now, because you didn't have no money to solve them. Now you're like, where they at? Let's do it. Because there's no growth without problems. There's no growth without failure. That is a fact. That is a fact. Um, Nate, how can uh, the listener go connect with you or, le or uh, learn more about you? And so I got, um, you know, TikTok, you guys, this is my handle, Nate.Barger, but I got a, a Facebook group with over 230,000 people in it. I go live every week. I show people how to do this stuff for free. Um, for those of you that are looking for something a little bit farther, um, more than that, 
I have an academy. It's Burr Invest Academy. Amazing academy um, that you guys can get in. We're there step by step for you guys. We got weekly coaching calls and we got city groups. We're in over 23 cities now. We'll be in over 40 cities by May. We have live meetups all the time, walkthroughs on properties, um, sharing vendors and contractors and deals and, and, and putting money in together. So we're building out a huge, we will be the largest real estate group in the country um, in the next couple of years. And my goal is to help 10 million people become millionaires. I want you to be one of them. Not you. I already know you're a millionaire, bro. I love it. I love it. Uh, someone asked on TikTok, uh, I've been following you for a while. How do we do some business? How do we do some business together? Just right now, man, send me some deals, send them over in my inbox. Um, but right now, man, if it ain't a big deal, like it ain't 20 million plus, man, I just really, it's, it's kind of deals are great and I love them, but I love to learn more than anything. So we're building a hundred million dollar property down in Florida going vertical. Um, I've never done one of those before. We're building, um, and I ain't going to tell you about, we got a multi-billion dollar property we're working on on an island right now um, that my partner's wow. flying out to see next Monday. And I mean, it's it's a thousand acre development on the ocean. It's insane. So, I mean, if it's a deal, here's what you do. Whenever you get a deal, guys, and you send it over to somebody, I learned this a long time. My partner, Mike, we had a guy that was like killing it and he's still killing it. He does 50 or $100 million a year worth of ground out developments. And he said, nah, Nate, I ain't taking this to him until we have it wrapped up and ready. What that means is don't bring me something that you heard about from another wholesaler. Don't bring me a deal and you want my opinion on if it's a deal. If you really want to partner with somebody, whether it's me, Jason, whether it's somebody else that's killing it, have the deal already put together and say, look, man, here's why it's a deal and here's the play. And if you don't know how to do that, then you need to get in. I ain't going to say my academy. I'd like it if you do, you know, if it's a good fit for you. But Jason, you teach people, don't you? Yeah, I, I teach people how to bring deals. Yeah. Yeah. So he teaches people, but get around somebody that's done it because this stuff here is real world, man. This is where you become wealthy. You become wealthy. Now, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. People ain't going to like it, some people. But I'm going to say it. Look, when I was poor, all I knew how to do with money was spend it. When I start hanging around the middle class people, all they knew how to do was save it. When I got around rich people, all they knew how to do was invest money. But when I became wealthy, bro, I learned the key was to go as deep in debt, owning good assets that are going to appreciate, spin off cash flows and give you tax incentives. That's what you do when you're wealthy, man. You don't really pay much federal taxes either, man. And you probably can qualify for Obamacare and all this stuff, man. I'm not making it up. It's called accelerated depreciation. And when you understand it, you're going to say it's not fair. Look, man, I don't want to hear it's not fair. You know the rules. And if you don't know the rules, then learn the rules. Because society doesn't care how you feel about it. The fact of the matter is how you feel about it is going to it's going to determine your future. It's going to determine your great, great grandkids future. So get out here today, get educated, learn the stuff that real estate people know, professional investors know stuff. Me and Jason have learned self-made millionaires right now. I hate to say self-made without God made, but I'm just telling you guys, 88% of uh, millionaires are self-made. You should be one. hundred percent. There's nothing stopping you. That's right, bro. All right, Nate. Well, hey, uh, this is fantastic. Uh, one of the episodes I've enjoyed most uh, interviewing. It was great hearing about your story and, uh, you know, would love to uh, do a deal together sometime. So um, I'm going to bring you some deals here soon, Nate. <laughs> hey, man, let's, let's just put it together. This last this next recession, we are by a whole state. What state you want to get, man? Man, Arizona. I'm looking at Arizona <laughs> lately, but Arizona is going to Arizona is woo. You guys know Arizona is getting overbuilt. It's going to pull back really heavy. We're already seeing a 20% drop in Arizona. Goldman Sachs came out the other day and said that there's four cities that could see a 2008 like recession. Phoenix was one of them. So, um that's why you buy there though. You got to buy a great deal. That's there. why you buy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, here's what I tell people if last year you were comfortable buying paint. Here, let me give you some quick math, man. Do you mind one more thing, Jason? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. 
All right, so I had an apartment building I was selling. I had it under contract for eight point, I want to say it was 8.8 .8 million. Had a buyer 8.8. .8. And I picked it up. I think we owe about four point something million on it. So we was going to make some money off of it. The deal fell through because of debt, right? Now, interest rates went from 4% to 6%. So, so the seller, let's say 20 bips. So 20, 20, you guys know what 20 bips are? 20 or, or, or 200 bips, 200 basis points. That's two percentage points. So let's say he was borrowing 7 million times 0.02. That's 14,000. Is that right? 7 million. It should be more than 7 million times 0.02. That's $140,000 a year. And more in debt is what this person is going to have to pay because the interest rates went up, right? You follow me? Yeah. Let's say he's got a five-year term on that. That's $700,000 more he has to pay in debt. But guess what? That deal fell out. We back under contract is $7.2 million. $7.3 million. So we took a million and a half less. So he has to pay $700,000 more, but he got picked it up for a million and a half less. So who don't care about the interest rate? I don't care about the interest rate. I don't. I'm, I became wealthy borrowing money at 11 and 12%. Care about the deal. Quit worrying about the interest rates. Look at the bottom line. That's what makes sense. Does the deal make sense? If it makes sense, then why do you care? You're picking up a property cheaper now than you probably did last year. You're not competing against all the people. Now, I don't know about where you're from, Jason. You in San Diego. How's, it, how's the market out there? The market is honestly, it's very resilient here. So um, a lot of owners have a lot of equity here. So we don't see a lot of pain here, but we still see deals. But um, the good thing is a lot of investors, it's tough to lose money here because it's a very, it's a very resilient market. I'm like something like Phoenix, right? So um, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what you do. If a deal was good last year and now this year you got to pay a little higher interest rate, but you're picking it up cheaper. Just run the math on it. This is a math problem is all you have. Yep, exactly. You marry the property, but you date the rate. There's too many people who care only about the rate. And that's what kind of stops people from doing a good deal. I mean, um, plus also there's many other options to creatively finance. So you can get a, I mean, rates are at six, 7%. I got a 5% interest rate on the last nine unit property I bought at 5.1% interest only for 15 years. So there's ways to creatively finance these deals, but many people don't just understand. They just see the consumer market, what rates are today, but there's always a way to make a deal work if it's, if it's well-priced. That's right. That's right. Absolutely, Jay. Well, thank you so much, brother. And if you guys need a deal, man, reach out to Jay. He's got you covered. <laughs> Thanks, Nate. It was, it was great having you on. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you, man.